First of all, I have to apologize for my voice. The dry air in this part of the world doesn't agree with me. And so I have a bag full of cough sweets and I've got water here and I hope I'm going to be able to survive the day. Um, what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit of my autobiography in the sense of how I came to write what I did. And I realize that another person who had a different life path and met different people but was interested in temple studies would perhaps have produced something very different. But I can look back to certain events in my life, meeting with certain people, and say, yes, that was a point at which a new section started. But this all began a long, long time ago when I was um, a student, an undergraduate student in Cambridge, England. And when I had finished my three years there, I was left with a feeling, not of elation, but in fact of disappointment, which is why I didn't stay to do any postgraduate work, because I felt that somehow everything we had done had missed the point. Now, this is a terrible thing to say because I had some wonderful teachers, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And one of the things that struck me most was that there was no obvious link in the stuff I was taught, and I may have gone to all the wrong lectures, but I don't think I did. Um, there was no obvious link between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the life of the early church and its worship. These were separate compartments. And later in my life, I was asked by a very distinguished Cambridge Don teacher why I studied the Old and New Testaments. And he was very surprised when I said they're usually sold as one volume. <laughs> and, <laughs> you see, this, this, is what, this is what we're up against. Um, now, what we did as undergraduates wasn't that's what we call students as undergraduates, we looked at all sorts of things which were, as so though you were constantly peeling the vegetables, never actually getting a meal. And so we looked at the sources of the Pentateuch, J, E, D, and P. Now lots of people have been drilled in that, haven't you? And then we looked at the sources of the books of Kings and Chronicles. And at the end of it, we had learned all about these redactors that the Germans were so very fond of. And then we did the sources of the Psalms. That got a little bit near to theology, but, you know, not close enough to be much use. And in the New Testament, we did the sources of the Gospels. <clears throat> and then we came to the fourth Gospel. And then the big question was not what was John talking about or writing about, but did he know the synoptic gospels? And I thought at the end of this, goodness me, um, this was a course of literary criticism. It wasn't really what I was hoping for. Um, so I didn't stay in Cambridge. I, I went off and did my own thing. And then I discovered the apocalypses. And this is something that wasn't taught very much in England, I think not at all at the time. And I discovered particularly Enoch, and I started working my own on Enoch. And then the, we had living next door to us in the village where I was by then married, and we were living in a village in Derbyshire. There was an elderly clergyman, an Anglican clergyman, who was retiring and downsizing his library. And he said to me one day, there's some books, would you like them? And he gave me R.H. Charles's first edition of Enoch in English, wow, and the three volumes of Sweet Septuagint. And I went off like a squirrel and put these in my treasure place. And that's how I got interested, really interested, in Enoch, and particularly in the different varieties of texts, because I could look at those, the Septuagint with all those terrible footnotes that go on forever and get smaller and smaller, and think, well, how is it possible? that this Greek came from this Hebrew. And that's when I first started being aware of the varieties of the text. And then I wrote the Older Testament and the Gate of Heaven and things like that. And they were published. They were published because I was fortunate to meet a very distinguished Jesuit theologian, biblical scholar, Father Robert Murray great Syriac scholar, wonderful man, 
And people sometimes say to me, well, how did you meet Father Murray? You know, because he was just this great man and I was this Derbyshire housewife. And the answer is we met on a bus. <laughs> and we met on a bus going to Birmingham. And he was obviously very tired from flying in from Rome and he fell asleep on my shoulder. <laughs> And we have been friends ever since. He's still alive. He's a very, very frail old gentleman. But he was a great influence on me and opened up all sorts of, of ways for me. And he encouraged me to publish. And that's why my first book was dedicated to him. So that was the first extraordinary thing. You know, how do you come to meet these people? And then this elderly vicar who gives me these old books. And then... I had, did a study day in Oxford, I often do study days around the place, but I started doing them a long time ago, and um, one young lady came up to me afterwards, and she'd just completed, she got a first class degree from Oxford, and she said to me, you know, the question that worries me is, well, what happened to Yahweh in the New Testament? And I thought, well, that's a very good question. And that's when I wrote The Great Angel. But The Great Angel, Study of Israel's Second God, wasn't the book I set out to write. I set out to write something very different. And when I was about a third of the way through the other book that never came to be a book, I realized I was having to reject a lot of evidence. And in the end, I abandoned the book I'd intended to write and wrote a book from the rejected evidence, which, of course, became The Great Angel. So that was the next step forward. Um, and then I had the great privilege of knowing the late, great Mary Douglas, the anthropologist, a wonderful, wonderful lady. Been dead some six, seven years now, but she was, a, she was just an experience. And she was writing at that stage of her writing. She was writing about atonement and Leviticus. And listening to her talking about atonement, Atonement. All sorts of things clicked into place. And that's when the atonement bit and the characteristic treatment I had of atonement, that's how that came about. And then I had an invitation out of the blue from the University of Aberdeen. I'd never been so far north in England. The problem of getting a train ticket from Derby to Aberdeen is quite something. In those days, it was amazing. Um, but I went up and I did the, these lectures, and I was exploring the idea. For the first time, I was using early Christian liturgy material, and I was exploring the idea that resurrection was more than simply a sort of physical restoration. And looking at the idea of resurrection, which became the kind of temple, for me, temple characteristic, the idea that resurrection is what um, some religious groups nowadays still call being born again. And the implication of that for um, the study of early Christian texts. And then, because the millennium was approaching at about this time, I thought I would do what I wanted to do for a long time and write on the book of Revelation. I did that. And incorporated for the first time Dead Sea Scrolls material. That was a very interesting thing to do. Meanwhile, on another part of my desk, I was writing the Isaiah section of the Erdman's New Millennium Commentary. And I discovered for the first time the problems of freedom of speech, if you are writing something that these advocates of freedom of speech don't actually like. And if you... Yes. And when they control publishers, this is quite difficult. And I sent my thing on Isaiah in, and it was the right length, and it was on time, and the book was delayed and delayed and delayed, and I got back to the editors, and they said, oh, delayed. So I thought, somebody hasn't submitted on time, you know. Wondered who it was. And in the end, one of them said, well, actually, you're the problem. And I, oh, dear, they don't like what you've written. And I said, well, they shouldn't have asked me. Um, and I refused to move. And, then, and in the end, you can check this out, Erdman's Millennium Commentary now has got another title and was published in 2003, not 2000. And that's one of the reasons. So that was my first brush, my real first brush, with people who didn't really like to um, publish what they didn't really want to publish. And then the Revelation book was published, and it was reviewed for the Times Lit, Times Literary Supplement, by someone called David Melling. And he got in touch with me as a result of writing this review, and he turned out to be the man who is currently compiling an orthodox encyclopedia, a great authority on the Orthodox Church and a wonderful musician. Died a few years ago, and I dedicated one of my books to him. 
But we got in touch. And I was telling him at this stage certain things that I'd been talking about and thinking about. And he suddenly sort of shot up and he said, oh, do you know this? And he produced a copy of this wonderful Byzantine hymn honouring Mary called the Akathist Hymn. And I read it through, and I'd never seen it before, but I knew exactly where all these titles had come from. And I said to him, well, I, I know where this stuff has come from. And he said, well, that's why I showed it you, you know. Um, and that started me on this path. Now, this wasn't a sort of serious scholarly method. It was simply joining dots. I said, well, I know where that's come from, where that's come from. And further research, I could see where other things had come from. So that's where the lady first came into my temple studies um, and then another thing happened in my life I found myself invited a huge honour and totally unexpected out of the blue I was invited to join the environment symposium of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew and joined his kind of team of people who set things up he's a wonderful inspiration and I was the biblical scholar in that outfit for 13 years um, and that's now um, on hold a bit because the person who organised it is terminally ill and so we're not sure what's going to happen now. Not, not the patriarch, the lady who was organising it. But that made me realise all sort of other aspects of temple theology, the application to the environment, things like that. And from that there came the creation book. And then all sorts of other things followed. Um, really quite extraordinary mix of things that simply happened in my life. And as I look back now, and I've been signing some books this morning, my life has been flashing before me as I see all these titles. And I think, yes, but if I hadn't met that person, if I hadn't been in that place, if that penny hadn't dropped, I don't know if you use that expression in America, but if something just hadn't sort of clicked with me, this would never have happened. And so looking back over how I have done temple studies, this is in some ways my autobiography, somebody else doing temple studies with a different life path would have picked up different emphases, would have written books with different titles, picked up different things. So given that there's so many people interested in temple studies with all their different life paths and experiences, I have a feeling that there is an awful lot out there still to do. I'll hand over now to Lawrence, who's going to tell you something about temple studies, how it developed in England. Um. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking uh, Professor Phil Barlow very much for, for hosting us here and um, to thank my, my friends in Utah, too many to, to name, but especially Gary and uh, Professor Jack Welsh and Professor John Hall um, for making this event possible. Uh, it's tremendously exciting for me to be here with you. Um, I've never had a cool welcome in Utah. I've been here several times, and this is one of the warmest I've ever had. And uh, it's a privilege to be on this platform. Um, I could tell a very similar story to Margaret's, but she's asked me not to, but rather <laughs> to, talk about, to talk about the Temple Studies, um, the foundation of the Temple Studies group uh, in, in Britain. Um, but I, I, I want to begin really where I think Phil Barlow left off. And Phil Barlow gave you some definitions of religion. Um, and one of those is Paul Tillich's, and it's the one which I think still um, sits at the foundation. And it's very interesting because Paul Tillich's is a definition of theology because he was a theologian. He wasn't a religious studies man, but it belongs in religious studies. Because his definition is, it's our ultimate concern. And the question there is, who is the we? Well, it's a human we. Now, religious studies, as far as I can see, is the human study of religion. But if you're a theologian, you ought to be doing something slightly different. And what is that? For me, both faith and the work of theology has always been not about ultimate concerns, which it seems to me is about where humans reach the highest. You know, politics is something to do with ultimate concerns then. It's when God speaks. That's when religion begins. When God speaks. All of us live out of religious founders. Joseph Smith is an immensely important religious founder. 
very recognisable to a Catholic myself, uh, like myself, because my own tradition is filled with charismatic religious founders. But these are not men and women who made it up. They are men and women who listened who opened themselves or were opened in some unusual way to when God speaks. And the history of temple studies for me is about understanding how it is that God has spoken on the earth. And that's what led me into, into temple studies. And for me, as a Catholic, the sacred liturgy is the, the, the way in which, it's not the words that God uses, because they are human words, but it is the throat, it's the voice which God adopts, um, or God gives uh, to humanity to sing uh, his praises and to give glory to God. And that, my own frustration, my own biographic, biographical account of my way into temple studies would dwell on that, that frustration at sitting in universities where I was constantly told that theology was a human concern, when my heart constantly told me that my job was not to make it up, but to listen. And that's how I was taught um, uh, uh, theology. So uh, one of the jokes that I often make when, I, uh, is that, uh, when I'm in Utah is that you know, the people like me like to talk about the difference between mainstream Christians and Mormons. But when you're in Utah, um, you are the mainstream, you know, those of you who are Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and so people like me who start using phrases like that look faintly ridiculous. But one of the things that I keep saying to my fellow Catholics is you are no longer mainstream because we have been through a convulsion in the Catholic Church in the last one to two hundred years that's transformed our self-understanding. And I tease many Catholic theologians that the modern understanding of Jesus is a, a terribly nice guy, probably with a beard, who I was saying to, to Phil Barlow earlier, if he hadn't been born in Israel, he would have gone to Berkeley. He probably <laughs> used to speak German, but he's got over that, and he now <laughs> speaks English. Um, um, and goes around the world doing good. And that is, no one in any form of Christianity uh, until about a hundred years ago, as far as I can tell, believed that. And therefore, one has to ask the question, what happened in that last hundred years? And what I was so frustrated with the, the way I was taught, uh, both the Old and the New Testament, that I just gave it up. I kind of put it on a shelf. And the liturgy became an outlet for me to, to, to be able to express the things that I really knew and wanted, uh, 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 knew were mainstream in the tradition and wanted to believe. And it was Margaret who actually helped me to rediscover the, the, the Old and New Testaments with, that I really believed. And just a coda to that, uh, a very old and venerable theologian who taught me a lot, Fergus Carr, once took me to one side. He said, remember, the Septuagint is the Catholic Old Testament, not the Hebrew Scriptures. And, that's an, and I knew that, but nobody had ever said that to me before. So I came across Margaret's work um, in the course of trying to explain how it is that Jesus was not a hippie, but rather somebody who fully understood who he was as the Son of God, as Yahweh. That Jesus is Yahweh is well understood by uh, the early church. Um, uh, and temple studies is the way to, as it were, at least open up the path to ask what has happened to so-called mainstream Christianity that it has turned Christianity into something that it really never, would, that its, early, its antecedents would not have recognized. And that's why we founded the Temple Studies Group. Not in polemic either, nor in the modern way of bringing Christians of different traditions together to sit around a table and, and, and try to come up with a common formula, which actually means forgetting even more of what made you who you are. You know, and saying, well, you don't like that, so I'll rub that out of my experience. But rather looking for common ground. 
And the common ground, and this is this really is going to brings me to my conclusion, uh, in terms of the Temple Studies group, but also in terms of my own conversations with Latter-day Saints, because the common ground that we share is one of the murkiest periods in Christian experience. It is the first 100 to 150 years of the foundation of the Christian church. You know, I tease my friends in the Mormon church history department that, you know, at the origin of, Christ, uh, of my form of Christianity, we have icons, and at the origin of yours, you have photographs. But <laughs> the, the reality... <coughs> The reality is, the reality is that the origin of our common Christian heritage is those murky 150 years, which are so ill-documented, which Margaret's work has opened up. Which, but so much of what I know of of my own tradition corroborates many things that she has taught me, but many things that Latter-day Saints have taught me that Mormons also know, which is why I know we share a common root. And that's why I think that's why I think Mormons have been so important in the unfolding of Temple Studies. That's why uh, I'm always been delighted when I know that there are some Mormons at the Temple Studies uh, meetings in the UK. I know I have friends because I'm more likely to um, have things thrown at me by modern Catholics or Protestants who don't know what they ought to know and by Mormons for whom this material is, is actually much more readily accessible, which is why so many of you come here uh, today. But the Temple Studies Group was founded to help, uh, as a gesture, to, to help the, f- the finding of the whole of Christianity back into an understanding of those first 150 years and how those 50, f- first 150 years shaped our respective traditions and inheritances so that we know that maybe Jesus did have a flowing robe and maybe he did have a beard, but he also understood the meaning of priestly vestments and he also believed that he was the owner of them. And when we understand that, then we can begin to do temple studies. So that, that I hope, explains why I'm here. <clears throat> Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think I'd like to say that my exposure to Temple Studies really began in my freshman year at BYU with a man named Hugh Nibley. Professor Nibley was the man from whom I guess I taught took the most classes as a student, and he taught me pseudepigrapha, apocrypha, and temple studies in an approach that I would have been unable to define at the time, namely the approach that Gary Anderson mentioned of Cambridge patternism, a comparative approach that is very productive in seeing beyond the text to what lies underneath the text. Now, when I first began to participate in the Temple Studies group in London as, uh, as an attendee and as reading papers, at that point in time, Temple Studies was, uh, was meeting in a magnificent location, which it continues to meet, namely the Temple Church, built by the Templars in medieval times and now administered by the Church of England and by a very good scholar by the name of Robin Griffin who is Master of the Temple. That is his title. And he welcomes us to that uh, location to have the Temple Studies group meetings in London. And those who attend represent a variety of disciplines. They may be Protestants, or they may be Catholics, or they may be Mormons, or they may be Russian Orthodox, or they may be Greek Orthodox. But the value of those meetings and of the papers read there is the varying perspectives which are brought to a single subject. And from that variety of perspective, great synergy happens so that a greater understanding of the subject being examined is able to be reached. Temple studies is what we might call an ecumenical study, 
a study that allows for the interchange of information, for the exchange of perspective in such a way that we are able to use the comparative approach that constituted Nibley's work for his whole career to learn about the temple in all contexts, Judeo-Christian, but also in contexts that precede Judeo-Christian, like ancient Egyptian or Greek or Roman or Middle Eastern religions, etc. For that reason, as we glean from the history of man, information about the temples that existed and that were sites whereby man thought he could become closer to the divine and be move into the presence of the divine, we're able to understand what the temple is in relation to ourselves and in relation to whatever our respective beliefs might be. Therein is the great value of temple studies, and as the conference proceeds today, and as papers are given on various topics, I hope that you'll keep in mind that comparative approach that ability to look at the temple from many perspectives and from each of those perspectives will come beneficial knowledge to help us better hone our own individual perspectives into our relation to our Father and to Jesus Christ as we believe because the temple in all ages are structures that relate to them and to what they would have man understand about them in man's quest to return to them. Thank you. I guess we're uh, speaking autobiographically. Mine will be brief. Um, I have not been a major contributor, though I've been a major follower of temple studies for quite some time. Um, and like so many Latter-day Saints, like most of those who've gotten seriously involved in it, I suppose my introduction, the pivotal experience for me, came with the introduction to Hugh Nibley. Um, he, uh, he taught not only specific um, uh, facts about antiquity, but more important for me, he introduced an approach, uh, a way of thinking about antiquity, whether this or that particular proposition survives uh, continued study or not is, uh, is less important than the overall model, the way of thinking about things that has been enormously influential on me and, and that I've found enormously fruitful. I'm not surprised to see such, such a large crowd here. I had a smaller group last night. I mentioned the fact that years ago, I think it was in connection with Nibley's retirement, uh, Klaus Baer, Egyptologist from the University of Chicago, Chicago came to uh, came to BYU to deliver a series of lectures on the Egyptian temple. And uh, the way he approached it, as I recall it anyway, it's been a long, long time now. I was an undergraduate student then. Um, he, his approach to the temple, to my mind, drained the temple of most of its interest. It was, uh, it was mostly about the economic role of the temple in Egyptian society and so on and so forth, which I found not particularly exciting. But nevertheless, he was stunned because he normally spoke to groups of 5, 10, 12 people at most. Um, and here he had hundreds of people. You know, they were standing in the doorways at BYU to listen to this man speak about the Egyptian temple. He was shocked. I was not, because Latter-day Saints are that interested in the temple. It is, it's the central thing for us. Uh, many of you know, we, we talk about it constantly. The, the most important thing we can do is, of course, bringing people to Christ, but we also talk about bringing people to the temple, getting them to the temple to, uh, to take the, the covenants there. Now, uh, Nibali did not seem to have an impact on the next generation. Uh, it, it skipped a generation in a way, an odd way, I think. Um, but uh, in temple studies, as in so many other regards, the next generation, the, the grandchildren of Nibley have, have continued to contribute. And I think I'm very proud of the fact, for example, that two rather significant books on the temple, more than two actually, published uh, by non-LDS publishers, um, have been dedicated. There are two that are dedicated to Hugh Nibley, and that's uh, David Seeley and Bill Hamlin's uh, uh, 
Solomon's Temple in myth and history, whatever it's called, and <laughs> and uh, and then John Lundquist's book on the Temple of Jerusalem. He's also done a really important uh, volume on the Temple Meeting Place of Heaven and Earth. Um, <laughs> It's continuing very much in the spirit of Nibley, and I don't know that anybody else or very many other people noticed the dedication in each of those, published by, you know, Thames and Hudson and uh, uh, Prager, I think, is the other one, um, dedicated to Hugh Nibley. That's significant for those who, who know the background, the intellectual background of that. Um, I just want to say one other quick autobiographical thing for me. I, I think, I'm not sure, but I may be the first Latter-day Saint uh, who noticed the work of Margaret Barker. I'm not sure, and I can't claim any any great virtue in that. It was sheer dumb luck. Um, I I was at an ARSBL meeting, the American Academy of Religion Society of Biblical Literature, and um, and there was the book, The Great Angel, sitting on the shelf. And I, I go to those meetings. Yes, the sessions are interesting, but I love what Bill Hamlin and I call the bookanalia which is the big, <laughs> all the books are on sale for 50% off, 90% off. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's just horrible. My house is awash with stacks of books. I have no, no longer the shelf space for them. Uh, but I saw that book and thought, now this looks really interesting. I brought it home and it sat there for a few weeks. And then one night I was sitting in my office and it began to sort of pulsate on the bookshelf. <laughs> Read me, read me, read me. So I pulled it down, and I have to say, and I don't know how she'll take this, but I have to say, I began reading it, and I thought, good grief, this person has to be a Mormon. <laughs> and I think, no, 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 she's not. And I, yes, she is. She's got to be. There were so many things there that were so stunning to me that I'd never read from anybody other than one of our sectarian <laughs> co-believers. I was just stunned at the book and, uh, and began talking to people about it. And as I say, I don't claim any great credit for having found it, but I did, and it was transformative for me, just fascinating, stunning. And so it's really exciting to have a program like this. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, Dan, and everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today. We're looking forward to a great day, and I don't want to delay getting into Margaret's paper. Uh, but I do want to say that I certainly share a lot of the uh, autobiographical experiences that uh, we've heard from the others, uh, including Hugh Nibley, who was my Honors Book of Mormon freshman first semester teacher. And uh, Nibley has the kind of mind that moved many inert mountains mentally, and mine was uh, one of those. And Margaret has had a similar effect. Uh, the friendship that we've had has been uh, very productive, and you know things are moving in the right track when ideas are generative, when you're going down a path and you keep finding good things you know you're moving in the right direction, and Margaret has been doing that. I think it's been good to have these introductions so you can get to know people a little bit more personally. These introductions are important, and Margaret and Lawrence have introduced us to many ideas and have introduced us as Latter-day Saints to the Temple Studies programs when we've spoken over in London. So it's our great privilege to welcome them on this occasion here to the United States. But this takes me back to one other time I welcomed Margaret, and that was uh, when we did the Joseph Smith Bicentennial at the Library of Congress. And Margaret was one of the speakers in the session dealing with Joseph Smith and his perception uh, of uh, and very deep insights into the ancient world. I picked Margaret up at the airport, uh, and uh, she had flown in. She was hobbling because she was in great pain. We're glad that her hip is now better. We put her in a wheelchair and brought her to the uh, uh, hotel. And uh, I just want to also say it's that kind of dedication that is the, the sign of a dedicated life like the kind of life that Lawrence, as a dedicated Catholic priest, deacon, uh, lives, and that we as Latter-day Saints, I think, can especially appreciate that Margaret would have come under those conditions. Uh, I picked her up the next morning when we were on the way right over to the Library of Congress to have her speak, and one of her 
one of the parts of her paper dealt with the tree of uh, uh, of life and the uh, the white fruit mentioned in First Nephi chapter eight uh, in Nephi's uh, Lehi's vision. And true to form, Margaret had been up early in the morning rereading First Nephi chapter eight to be sure she had all of this fresh in mind. And as we were going over to uh, the Library of Congress, she said. I saw something very interesting I'd never seen before, and as I read through this, I said, there it talks about an iron rod that leads to the tree of life. And all of a sudden it connected in my mind that in Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, now the King James says that God will there beat people with a rod of iron. But the Hebrew can just as well be leads people with a rod of iron. Well, I use this as an example of when God speaks, when God blesses us with ideas. You know, it's not just dumb luck sometimes. Uh, Sometimes it is on our part. It always is on our part. Uh, But it's the hand of the Lord blessing people like Margaret and Lawrence and so many of us who all of whom want to understand not just a rational theology. Now that takes care of the creed that we believe, not just a moral theology, that takes care of the code. Not just a natural theology that takes care of community. What Margaret has introduced, and Margaret, I believe you're the first person to use the phrase temple theology, and I sure hope you'll all read the book uh, entitled Temple Theology, which adds to our religious experience an understanding of theology that is based on patterns, on priesthood, on ordinances, on structure, on mystery, on revelation, on things that belonged to the temple originally and still do today. Today we celebrate temple theology. Margaret, Lawrence, welcome. Welcome to both of you. Thanks to all of you for being here.